Welcome back to the Sea Mask Podcast with Nick, Tim, and me. Mike's missing today. It's his daughter's birthday, so congratulations to Mike and his family for the happy day today. And we are going to talk about the models of masculinity series that we started last time, looking at Noah. And today we're looking at Abraham. And most people think of the sacrifice of Isaac. What does it mean to really put God first and trust in God? Big question for many guys today, because we can be asked to give up many things for God. Some people, it might be careers or relationships. So I think it's a good topic to explore. And what does a man do in that situation? Nick, have you felt like you have had to give up something dear to you because of taking your Catholic faith more seriously? For instance, what if God said, if you love me, you'll give up your mustache? Just one instant. Perfect example. I would be an efficient apostate. No, <laughs> obviously. Um, I think I'd make a lot of people happy. Uh, I might be the only sad one. Me and like two other people might be the only sad ones. Um, it's God funny you ask. It. <laughs> it's funny you ask that in that way, Will, because I sort of have a um, a past with the story of Abraham and Isaac. Um, it was somewhat of an integral part of my falling away from the church. Uh, and when I pseudonymously wrote this very arrogant uh, quasi-memoir, um, uh, I called it the Agadah, A-K-E-D-A-H, which is um, the, the name for the, the story of the Binding of Isaac. And just couldn't fathom, you know, a, a 16-year-old atheist who thinks he knows everything obviously doesn't understand that God requesting the life back of one of his creations is not the same as, you know, God asking or Tim asking like his kid for their life or me taking the life of somebody on the street. And, and I didn't understand that. And I just thought that this was a perfect example of the um, caprice and evil nature of the old Testament God, um, and I sort of threw that in the face of my parents. Like, this is, what if they asked you? What if God asked you to take my life? I remember like talking about uh, give, giving my dad the example of like a shooting range because we, you know, we would go to the shooting range sometimes. It's like, what, what if God said, you know, Mr. Stumphauser, I know you believe in me, but you know, you don't really sing that loud at mass. I want you to show me that you believe in me. And when Nick is shooting target practice i want you to shoot him in the back of the head like what would you say to god you know i thought thought it was the greatest checkmate ever um and that was representative of the pride that i had as an atheist that that i think that was probably the biggest thing that i had to give up in the return to my catholic faith um god was very graceful and gentle with me in that he could he could have humiliated me very strongly as I came back. Um, but he allowed it to be slow so that I could uh, be gently let down and humble, humble myself. Um, but I mean, I was telling everybody in my high school, I was telling everybody who would listen all of the reasons in which I was super smart and God was definitely not real. And I had to let all of that go as I, as I returned to the faith. I think a lot of people have a similar story about this particular moment in the Bible. And yeah. there's even something called the the Marcionite heresy, right, Tim? Which is that basically the Old Testament God isn't really the Christian God because the Christian God wouldn't ever give such commands or act in such a way. Mm. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Turns out it's incredibly common. Like if you could shake Nick, your 18 year old self, you're like, this is, this is an embarrassing one. Cause that, there's nothing <laughs> more normy than, than being uh, really, really, really alienated by, by that, 
that story. And yeah, then the, you know, the Marcionites sort of, sort of proved the case. Um, you know, if you could only communicate with your 18 year old, more and more as I get old, by the way, I think, um, a lot of my impulses at 18, I thought were real. I, I, I look back on that in twenties and thirties, I thought were unhealthy. I'm like, I think my sort of natural impulses to do kind of wild things make sense. But a lot of my intellectual positions were wrong. And I, hmm. I think a lot of people think it's the other way around. And I'm like, I'm yeah, the same way. You, you probably thought that was uh, yeah unique or something. And it's like, man, there's nothing more. Average. Oh, I did. I did. Yeah. I was like, I remember sitting in, in St. Patrick's church, hearing that in, in Brighton, Michigan, and like looking around at all these people and being like, I'm the only person in here with like uh, empathy and awareness. Like all of these people are brainwashed and stupid. And like, I am literally at, at 17, the only person who has like ethics understanding and but if, yeah, if you were to, uh, assess my, like you said, like impulses, like I was a, I was a good person, um, cognitively, I was just retarded. And I thought, I thought that, you know, the, the plight of the young atheist too, is thinking that you're just some Stradivarius, like you're the one who figured it out. Yeah. Instead of knowing it's like the most basic test in the Bible. Cause I mean, I guess, well, what you're, <laughs> what you're asking is, um, yeah, and instances about being asked to give something up. And people get accustomed to hearing stories about giving up like vices for God, which is, again, really uh, super mediocre conception of what God may ask you to give up. <laughs> Whereas, the, you know, I'm now, I guess, middle aged. And they sometime shortly after middle age, they say God stops giving you things and starts taking them back. It's probably more like the fifties, but um, I'm in my early forties. But the point is you do have to start giving up things that are not vices that are the most beautiful things God's given you. And to me, to me, it's just even the concept of family really hits you between the eyes and in the heart. And um, this is an important one to remember. It's not even, it's not even that most people are going to be asked by God to, to kill their son, but you know, hopefully you're, the children bury the parents and not the other way around. But a lot of people have to through, you know, the decay of time or sort of sped up decay of time, give up their spouse or one of their kids. And that's, that is, unnatural if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s but god you know god gives with both hands he takes back with both hands and um even the even the concept of that is um you know nascent in my intellect and that that's really really hard for me but it's like this story makes it really clear it, it, it's the best things he gives you too like a son or a daughter and and a wife of course and uh he can take them back right because you have no right even to your own existence. Like all of it is superfluous. We didn't, strictly speaking, deserve any of it. So I thought it was an important story to think about. And I think that the world today especially needs more Old Testament Christianity, not less. Like if you spend a few minutes on X looking at what men have to say about Christianity and why they're staying away from the church, etc., is because some of the really hard lessons about honor and duty and masculinity that some of these Old Testament stories make really clear are just regarded as offensive. Yeah. Uh, Will, I was just curious if, if you would answer that question. I'm, I'd be quite curious what you're, what you've had to give up for the faith. Obviously, I mean, there's some like some obvious answers, but <laughs> if there was yeah. something that maybe people wouldn't have expected that you that's been asked of you by God. Well, I think for people who don't know the story, the biggest one would be giving up what I imagined in the moment was my dream career for speaking the truth about just Catholic social doctrine and patriarchy in the family, because that was a big one for me. And that was like 
an earthly blessing in all kinds of ways for me and my family. But, you know, when the price is either like truth and personal dignity or riches or fame, whatever it might be, then you've got to choose the truth ultimately. And what the story with Abraham shows is that you trust that God has a plan and you're either walking in truth with him or eventually you're down the path of lies anyway. And I think that's the main principle I want to get across to people. But the other thing that's so important is that it's the only story most people think of when they think of Abraham. But there are a few others as well. If we're thinking about him as a model of masculinity, which is what this series is about, there are others that we need to look at. So I'm thinking of him as a figure who's got a lot to teach us about magnanimity, charity, also prudence as well. And we're going to look at a couple of things today that I think are neglected. So first of all, his handling of Lot and his victory over the four kings, his intercession for Sodom, super important the sacrifice of isaac obviously and then how he went about choosing a wife isaac as well so i'll just go through something i wrote a while ago as i was putting my thoughts about abraham together and then you guys chip in with comments as you go so the first one looking at his handling of lot and the victory over the four kings uh, after the herds of Abraham and his brother's son, Lot, grew too large, the pastures weren't big enough for both of them, so they had to separate into different lands. Even though he was the older man and God had promised the land to him, Abraham gave Lot the best part of the country. And I even think this is interesting. There's stuff to mm. learn here. Yeah. So he was the bigger man, right? So he didn't take the petty squabble. He just said, fine, you take it. Here it is. And there's something there, I think, that a lot of guys can learn from, which is that sometimes it is bigger just to walk away and avoid the petty squabble because you can get on with more important things in your life. You don't have to stop for every little fight like that. Nick, you were nodding. That one seemed to resonate. Uh, so just to... It was, who who gave Abraham gave the land to his two sons and they were squabbling and, and was it Lot who just so God had promised Abraham as the, the older man um, the best part of the land but Abraham just gave it to Lot instead and it was basically him not going according to plan and saying it's okay though if you're asking for it you can have it and, I'm and happy this is to walk son. away. Yeah, that's it. I just, there's... Uh, Lot's his brother's son. His brother's yeah, son. Lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lot's his brother's son, brother's yeah. son. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> there's there's obviously the what you just said with respect to, like, not haggling. Um, and I think there's two reasons why somebody might do that. Uh, but then the other, I was just thinking of sort of the boomer generation and their... Um, reticence to do something like that like provide sort of the best for their offspring for that generation like okay we'll just we'll just give them the best land i want to give them the best shot at starting in this world why well because i had my time in the sun like god provided for me abundantly they're just starting out like let's just give them that leg up and not see it as like it's being taken from me but rather there's just so much to go around like go for it. Um, but also I think, uh, magnanimity is so masculine, you know, having yeah. the big bigness of soul that if you're like overflowing with both, this is what I meant by two reasons, both the capacity to produce and that you are so blessed by God, um, then it's not a big deal to you. And Abraham was clearly, uh, cognizant that like God's given him so much so like he's not going to hold up destiny for these petty little things which in and of itself is my guess would have been like another test like god knew that lot was gonna say no i want the nicer bigger one and 
Abraham could have showed a lack of faith in God by saying, no, 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 that was what, you know, was promised to me. Like, no, I want the nicer, bigger, shinier one. Like, what the heck? Like, I did all this. I almost sacrificed my son. Like, give it to which is funny because, again, I say this a lot to Tim. I'm I'm constantly baffled by how much Christianity demands of a man. They and it's it's not just the material, it's also your heart. It's also how you feel about the thing itself. So it's not just that like maybe God asked for Isaac or maybe God asked for Abraham or expected Abraham to relinquish Lot's territory. It's that if Abraham did it and was bitter, he still failed the test. Like God wants your heart posture, not just the thing itself. And that's that's sort of what was made so evident about Christ and his law. It's like the Jewish law is, oh, just don't uh, commit the like, adultery itself. Jesus was like, don't even want to commit adultery. Because if you want to, you, you've done that. To me, you've done that. Don't even commit adultery murder don't want to commit murder or you've already done that yeah great point about the depth of magnanimity there and that's the first thing that struck me about that story was the magnanimity and the next one is when lot is captured by four kings raiding the lands of the king of sodom and then abraham doesn't really think much at all of lot's selfish behavior Instead, he just risks his life to rescue him, right? And then refuses a reward from the king. The only reward he really wants is the reward of a good conscience. So he's doing the right thing. And the reward doesn't really come into it. He's just doing it for its own sake. And that goes back to the point that Nick was just talking about regarding intention. Because if he goes to rescue lot but all he's really interested in is money right what does that tell you about his character as a man so that's just something else basic that stood out to me in terms of integrity that you're just doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do and if you really approach all your interactions in life whether personally or in business like that it's a really good principle to hold yourself to it's interesting that God started with the hardest test and then kind of went with easier tests. Like he sort of needed to know that of the next century or however long these stories take place with Abraham and um, all of the land and tribes and governance that he was going to do the right thing in each one of these situations. Um, Mm. And he does. He doesn't in every situation because you have um, uh, uh, what's his uh, illegitimate son's name? Um, not Ishmael. Ishmael. Yeah, Ishmael. Um, but he's starting with the, like, okay, so I need to know that you would be willing to let go of the thing that you hold most dear right now because, like, I'm about to go into business with you. God's like, I'm about to go into business with you, Abraham, and I need to know what kind of man that you are. And then everything else is like, okay, so remember when I asked you to give up your son? This is way easier. Don't screw it up. And I think what's ironic, though, is that, uh, who was it? Was it, it was Mike saying this on um, Pints with Aquinas, that, yeah, every, like, it actually kind of is easier almost to like if god very clearly tells you to do something and like you know it's god to do it because the only thing left to you is just fortitude and courage but when it's something really small and uncomfortable like this is the 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 personal flaws that i've been noticing is like when it's just tiny little comforts the fact that i still bitch about doing a daily rosary to myself is it's so humbling <laughs> but like if god hit himself or like an angel was like nick pray the rosary i'd be like absolutely every day like i heard you i've heard you ask me and i will i will comply um so maybe i recant my first thing and say that the harder tests were the were the ones after where it was like okay now that you know 
the masculine correct thing to do. I want you to do it in every circumstance. I think that's right. The, the, what you're talking about, Nick, in terms of like the building of the trust between God and Abraham is exactly right. But uh, the stuff we're talking about now is, is before um, Isaac, because what happens next is that God promises Abraham, then named Abraham, a son and says, look, you're going to be the father of many nations. And Abraham uh, is age 99, right? He's being told you're going to have a son. And he's thinking, what? I'm too old for that. His name even gets changed from Abraham to Abraham, meaning father of many. And despite that doubt, though, despite his age, he trusts in God's plan for his life. And there's a comment from St. Paul about this that it's about looking for a city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. So what Abraham does when he's told that this is God's plan for his life is submits to that plan rather than clinging on to his own out of his own pride. And I think that's another thing that can be very difficult to do today, especially because a lot of guys are looking ahead at the future and the uncertainty of the cultural landscape and thinking, is there a way to actually make it through this while being true to God and honoring him? That looks frightening. I might not be able to do it. So many young guys thinking about finding a wife, having a stay at home wife, having a family or the rest of it. They're wondering, I know this is what God wants me to do, but I'm doubting whether it's even possible. And that moment when Abraham, age 99, is told you're having a son, and it's okay, right. That's what's happening. I don't doubt it. Tim, you were nodding there. Have you felt this in your own life, the path ahead of you that God wants you to take, and part of you even doubts that it's possible? Yeah, I mean, I was talking about this yesterday. Like, sometimes um, if you have, if you live with any chronic pain, at all it is related you live with any chronic pain at all um it hits you more than others and um even the things that steph and i have gone through with abby you know our eldest daughter um this is usually where it hits me the hardest like um i don't know i get a lot of i get i tend i don't talk about this a lot on my show but i get i hold a lot of stress in my body so when, because I was so stressed out 16 plus years ago when Abby was born in Rome, um, with so many health issues, so many brain surgeries, it, it gives me, um, it, especially first it was, it was such a tall order. Cause I was like a young guy trying to work on a PhD in a foreign country, having pretty much just fun doing it at first. And then Abby's, Abby's born suddenly at eight months gestation and, and um, it felt like such a tall order. You know, Steph was in the hospital with her 29 nights. So at first it was just like overwhelming. And, you know, like it's clear, it's as clear as God telling you directly, okay, do this now, like be, be strong for your, for your daughter. And, you know, this isn't what you expected. You didn't expect, you know, both of you are young and healthy. You don't expect to have uh, a daughter with three brain surgeries in the first month of life. Um, and you just, you get through, I, I've sometimes go through and I just marvel at the fact that we got through and then came back to the States, ended up in law school, which is stressful enough on its own. And that's really when it's like PTSD hit me in, in law school, um, Abby's second, third, fourth years of life. And then I started just getting, I started noticing, um, and, and hearing from my, my, my dad about the kind of paternal line to get this genetically we just wear stress in our body and so get get chronic chronic pain and stuff and um i would always notice and i've noticed it more recently um especially stuff for abby is the most upsetting because i i like carry her around she's a 16 year old now and um 
Yeah, well, other other kids in a wheelchair or something. It's like you you see them; they kind of wheel up everywhere. They wheel to the car, and then they have a mechanical machine. We've never had anything like that. We have wheelchairs for her, but she hates them. She likes to hang out in the couch. And then if we all, if the family goes in another room, I just carry a carrier upstairs. It's kind of crazy. I mean, she'll be twenty soon. I'm just carrying around this adult, <laughs> which is kind of funny. But if I get like a bout of chronic pain, it makes it hard to hard to like live some it'll be like <clears throat> i'm being asked i know just by the circumstances to get her out of the car get her inside the house get her upstairs and um when when it's when it's non-negotiable and there's there's no doubt like this is what i need to do you just you, you, you go ahead and do it and I, I think i mean what what nick said is right i think the 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 less um, ambiguous it is as a choice and the more clearly delineated it is that just like this is either God or nature, uh, you know, the, the nature of God, God's nature telling me I, I must do this, the easier it is, even if it's a really hard task. And uh, the tricky stuff in life is when you have to deliberate mm -hmm. and it's not so clear what to do and what, what you're being probably asked to do by providence is uh very very difficult still that's it that's a bad combo but it, it's hard enough when you have to do something and it's just it's hitting you at your weakest you know mm. i don't know i've been i've been thinking about that a lot lately yeah really powerful answer and it ultimately does come down to trust in god's strength despite having a humble mistrust of your own frailty which is just reality like you know you've got limits you know that things can actually push you beyond them but you know that god's not going to give you anything that you can't handle as long as you're asking for his help and you're doing it with him it's a really important thing for guys to remember and that anecdote story there from tim just shows you that it can make up a very big part of your life as a day-to-day a -day struggle, Tim talking about holding stress in his body there. I think that should affect everyone's attitude to challenges they have to face long-term. Sometimes it's not fun and it hurts, but there's still a good reason tough. for it. Yeah, that's yeah. something that like, the um, the boomer generation like to make it seem like suffering was uh that their suffering was virtuous when a lot of times it was actually just them advocating for their preferences and um okay that was way too vague i understand uh, i guess what i'm trying to contrast is when you don't choose the suffering I get like a dead end job that you choose because like you're okay with being miserable or whatever isn't the same thing as like what Tim just described where it's like you don't choose this and you don't know where the end is, but you know that you're supposed to suffer in a particular way. That's I think what's sanctifying and it's pretty unique to men like picking arbitrary suffering or sort of meaningless suffering um, and plodding through it for a long time. That's not masculine. It's when things are asked of you and you don't know the termination date. You don't know the due date for this. Like Tim accepted this thing with Abby and you know, he talks about like whether or not she would have walked early on and stuff. And it's, it's just a giant question mark. And, you know, things are stable right now, praise God. But I'm sure early on there were, there were years where it's like, well, shoot, is she going to need another brain surgery? Like, how is that going to affect quality of life? How is that going to affect, like, not only her quality of life, but, like, the family and, like, the ergonomics and logistics of having a family? It's just a giant question mark forever. And, like, the man is expected to just basically say, whatever comes, like, I, I guess I'll just be here to deal with it because, like, that's what a man does. Mm -hmm. And that's just so different than, like, well, the real, the real masculinity is doing the same thing over and over again that you hate for a million years. It's like, not if that's what you picked to avoid other things. This is when yeah. it's like the unavoidable stuff. 
Mm. I don't know. Is that too vague, Tim? Do no, you- no. It makes All sense, right. Nick. Tim, go for it. Yeah, there's an acuteness to doing. There's always got to be an acuteness to the pain in order to to prove it on the touchstone of like, is this masculine virtue? Um, mm. Yeah, I would get that too. Uh, be be the be the mule. You know, just just go day in day out for your family. What 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 you know? The last few generations, not just the boomers, embraced as. A, a, a really domesticated iteration of of what we're talking about here is just i think there was a lot of vice came from it. it it was like we'll just go in day in day out provide for your family be the mule i was once told this um by and not 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 one of my parents or relatives or anything but a, a boomer a caring boomer who was trying to give advice when when abby was young and it wasn't just hey lift abby you know even if you're having pelvic pain or something like that um you know because there's an acuteness to that it's hitting you in your weakest spot lift abby up the stair you don't want her to be around you know downstairs alone something like that it was just like for 40 years just go into a career and and um you know just be the mule so your family can have good times even if you're not there with them and i'm like that's <laughs> i found that very very uninspiring i found that anti-inspiring because the goal is to um for, for a guy like me or a guy like will or a young guy now like you nick to set yourself up where you can work as much as you can around your family if you're a true family man, not just mm-hmm. the, the boomer version of it, but a true iteration of a family man, work as much as you can around them and have, you know, work smart, not hard, you know, and to set yourself up to, to, cause, cause life's challenges aren't really supposed to come from, from labor. It's certainly not exclusively <laughs> labor. So yeah, I think it's, it's just kind of like something you do during the day. And then the challenges come when you're spending time with your family yeah. and your daughter needs, you know, the, the left part of her brain to be diswired from the other, or whatever other people's struggles are. Um, you know, you're just going along living life and then a rain cloud comes over and settles on you. And um, Providence allows it for a reason for your sanctification. And like, like we've said, you know, kind of review of all the concepts here so far, your your um, continence or incontinence matters you know you, sh- you should be able to not embrace the pain but embrace the opportunity that it gives you and accept that this is part of god's plan for you and if you're a man you'll do it and um yeah i i so i think that the, the distinction between what we're talking about here true magnanimity manly virtue um is there is an acuteness to it it's not just oh this guy's a real hero he went in and sold insurance for fi- every day for 50 years to save up a lot of money i mean that just sounds like parable of the rich fool right mm-hmm. but um there's an acuteness to okay you're really weak here do for a short or a, a medium term of time the thing that hits you in your weakness the most i always try to because god doesn't ever give you more than you can handle I think that the term of time is really important. These challenges are not like, let's just see if you can hold your breath for the rest of eternity, or let's just see if you can go to a career you don't like for the rest of your life. That's not one of those tests from God. They're more acute. And it's also not fight club style machismo of I'm going to get punched in the face really hard for a set five minute window. So I feel alpha for a moment. It's you're going to hang on that particular cross until God decides it's time for you to get off, mm-hmm. like Christ Himself did. Right. Tim, you, you just made me realize something with the work distinction that you made there. If you look through biblical stories, I don't know of one where uh, the the moral lesson was you were supposed to till the field with more diligence that was sort of a given because it was how you survived the work that you did was how you survived it was when the rain didn't come what are you going to do like are you going to pray you're going to pray to god not 
I was too lazy today to like go take care of my crops and they all died. And God was like, Hey, dumbass, don't be lazy. And what's that, that reminded me of, it's like, okay, the curse of Adam is effeminacy. Oh, I don't want to work. It's going to make me uncomfortable. And for some reason, like the Protestant, this Protestant work ethic, this boomer work ethic thought that they somehow made some enormous moral achievement, some achievement of masculinity to just like not succumb to concupiscence, like to not just do the curse of Adam. It's sort of like a woman who gets, I mean, it's, it is more remarkable today, but it's like, cool, you're not trying to be a man in all ways. Like now you've just started becoming like a virtuous woman. That was baseline. Like guys who kick prawn addictions, like awesome job, but you're not like a good man now. You're just not like a chronically evil man. It's yeah. all right. Now that you're providing, then the challenges come. The challenges themselves isn't that you have a job. You need a job so that you can keep existing in order to endure real challenges. Right. Precisely. Yeah. This is like what we say about vocation, Steph and I in our um, Leave and Cleave book and what I say in the case for patriarchy, it's like Theoden tells his the writers of Rohan, like you have a three day ride to battle and yep. then the battle begins yes. know, when he's telling yes. Mary why he can't, he can't bear him. It's like the real battle is when a man gets home from work you know, eight hour shift, nine hour shift, 10 hour shift. That's just what you have to do. So everyone can eat. That's not, I mean, there's part of the nobility and I'm not denuding it of any vir of virtue because, you know, honoring your most basic, like lowest duty still has virtue in it, uh, discharging a duty. Okay. Check. But the higher duties are now praying with, playing with, leading, teaching once you get home. And here's the thing that, that interests me. Um, the higher duties are more time efficient. You don't have to do, it doesn't take eight hours for each of those. You know, right. the, the, you can do the higher, more synthetic um, intellectual, emotional things that you, you're called to do as a man in actually less time, the more rote thing you have to do, just toil every day, whatever your job is, it's, you know, it's really hard to do that in less than six hours, no matter what your job is. Um, yeah. So I think, I think that's, that's really important that, 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 um, entire generations just miss the, the whole point of being a, the, the vocation of being a family man is you want to spend time with your family. The, the best line in the Godfather is you can never be a real man unless you spend time with your family. And it, and whether or not it's true in the sense that whatever Coppola uh, had the line intoned by, um, you know, Vito, it's, it's certainly true because it, the vocation of most men is to be a family man. And it doesn't just mean that you divorce uh, the idea of I'm the laborer, I'm going to kind of get into it here, make friends at the office, make peace with the idea of never being home. Um, and just, I'm, and you know, I'll live vicariously through my family having a, a Saturday picnic because I'm going to work more and get more money. It's like, that's not it. You, you, you work, you deal with the fact that you're sort of divorced from your family every day and you, you don't try to mediate the gap. You're just like, oh, I, I want to get home with them as soon as I can after I'm work as soon as I'm done working every day. And I want to spend as much time as I can with them. But a lot of guys, instead of the constantly mediating that gap, uh, constantly negotiating the gap, they just say, you know, I'll just, I'll just sort of get comfortable here at the office. I'll make it like a second home. And, and I don't know. I, I don't know how we got on a whole work thing, but it, it is a big, it is a big part of the cultural conversation because our materialistic culture, particularly the one that's equal parts sort of Protestantism and in, in post enlightenment thought, you know, we are calling it boomer culture is very materialistic. And the closest that they ever get to talking about ethics is, is work ethic. So, uh, which is like a made up Protestant <laughs> thing. And, and they're literally like, okay, so just, just work a lot. It's like, well, no, that's like the baseline condition. 
Yeah, definitely careers existing for the sake of families rather than vice versa is super important. Some guys act like the family is just something that creates a nice life for them so that they can become energized to go to work and give their best there. But it's the other way around. The other thing about Abraham that I think is very important today is his reaction to God telling him that God is going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for their sins. So Abraham doesn't jump for joy. There's no kind of <laughs> glee involved in this. He's not like some of the accounts that you see on social media who will do what I call point and laugh conservatism when it's like, isn't this great that this happened to this degenerate person? Like they got what they deserved. Ha ha ha. So what does Abraham do? Uh, he prays for the sodomites. So it's a spiritual work of mercy. And he petitions God six times, showing such perseverance and such fervor as well, eventually getting God to grant his request for Sodom to be saved if it contains only 10 just men. Yeah. Yeah. So praying for sinners, praying for your enemies, I think that's something that would heal bitterness in a lot of hearts today. So men who think that the most masculine thing to do is to point and laugh at the degeneracy around you or look for ways to give cheap shots in comment boxes on social media. It's almost too easy to do that, given how bad things have got now. Like one example, forget about sodomites. One example is feminist women. When a middle-aged feminist woman uh, posts a picture of herself with a cat or a glass of wine or talking about what her night in looks like or how she's going out clubbing, a lot of those tweets go viral because of people mocking her. And that's not actually a masculine thing to do. It's far better to recognize the tragedy that's on display. The spiritual work of mercy is the more masculine response. So Abraham is a great example of that too. And it's so tempting. You know, if you're a guy who's very sensitive to what's gone wrong in male-female dynamics, to mock feminist women like that. And I don't think it's a masculine thing to do. Nick, how does that sound to you? You're in the younger generation. Have you noticed there's the temptation to, to mock and be gleeful about the idea of degeneracy and suffering? That is very inculcated. There's also the just enjoy the decline mentality. Um, so quick clarification question first, and then I have some thoughts on that. Was Sodom and Gomorrah in Abraham's purview? Like, Was that part of his uh, kingdom or allotment i'm not sure actually we could find out in a second tim do you know i think i think they were yeah yeah i, I can the check it i think they were because because lot lot was um resided it, in yeah yeah Sodom, he and his family right? had to leave and then his wife turned back yeah the, re the reason i ask is i feel like there's you know we are finite creatures and there's sort of this disordered perspective that i think um, a lot of Catholics or trads have where they, they put second things first or they put like 50th things first, mm. like, Oh, I'm going to adopt a kid from another country. And it's like, you have three kids and they, they haven't heard you say that you're proud of them in like months. Like don't adopt a child, be a better father first. Um, and so there's this attendance to what's happening really, really far outside of your purview under the auspices of virtue signaling. Or there's a complete abnegation of responsibility and then a celebration of the decline in general. So you sort of see both when it's let's mock and ridicule the degeneracy online or Let's just like pray that Jesus comes back because gosh, everyone's just so out of control. 
like let's put an end to this which is extremely effeminate it's extremely effeminate to say like just bring on armageddon because like i don't want to try anymore i think the balance is struck you know kind of a subsidiarity point of like focus on you first like i'm i'm working on a film with tim for feminism but like tim and i and you and i will have worked on like my actual personal effeminacy so that i can have successful relationships and like be a good father and if i made a like a a good movie but like screwed up my kids i failed and i might not make it into heaven because i was like a bad father and a bad husband um so there's there's probably a balance to be struck that if you were to just uh analyze the internet culture is not even close to being struck like everyone's very quick to ridicule Sodom and Gomorrah and then say like yeah rain rain the fire rain the fire down and like they haven't done anything to sort of merit that position contrast that with Abraham who's like by definition a righteous and holy man not sinless but very holy and he knows what's happening in Sodom and Gomorrah and he's still like can you please please spare them um it's sort of like if we were in Sodom and Gomorrah and we were like you know what yeah send down the fire god it's like you're still in the city like what are you doing do you think you're Abraham do you think you're righteous and that's sort of what Ripperger talks about with the chastisement is our lot is pun intended, uh, kind of intermixed with everybody. Now you don't get to extricate yourself anywhere, anywhere, unless you're out in the middle of nowhere and like damn near a saint. Uh, our lady of Akita says like, even the righteous are going to envy the dead. Yep, big tests coming. And we've worked our way through the points about Abraham that I mentioned at the start up to God's command to sacrifice Isaac, which is the, mo the main one that most people know about him. So this is the greatest test. And Isaac is at this point age 25 and you know means more to Abraham than anything else on earth. Coming back to Tim's point about the blessing of family. And Abraham is heartbroken about this command, but he puts his love for God above everything else. And also people forget this bit, but Isaac as well, like willingly submits himself to the sacrifice. And this becomes like a type of the father sacrificing his son on the cross. That's where it goes in the structure of the Bible overall. And when I was a kid, I didn't like this story either, Nick. Um, I thought that God was somehow testing Abraham for God's benefit. Like he needed to know something. Whereas really it's about testing Abraham for Abraham's benefit. So God doesn't need to know anything else. So what does it do for Abraham? It gives him the opportunity to grow in virtue. Like to grow in faith and to grow in love. And because of that opportunity, it can also increase his merits. So it's good that Abraham had to go through this. And that's why God only stays his hand at the last minute, mm -hmm. right? He has to go through all of it to be able to get all the benefit from it. And the principle is simple. It's unless you put your love of God first, your priorities are disordered. And it seems so simple to, to grasp, but to really apply it in life can be very difficult, very painful. And yeah, to bring the perfected act of Abraham on Isaac is Christ on the cross. A lot yes. of people don't know him. The, the um, Garden of Gethsemane is, yep. I think, on the backside of the um, Mount Moriah, which is where Abraham went with Isaac. So 
it goes back to that principle of God never gives us more than we can handle. Right. I mean, man, a good man, you know, as long as he's willing to go along with God, then God says, no, don't, you don't have to do this. I'll, mm. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. Um, a thousand years later, you yeah. know, and, um, and God goes through with it himself. He's the father that allows his son to be actually bloodied. And uh, there's, yeah. there's a lot more likenesses between, um, Abraham, Isaac, God, the father, God, the son. And, um, I'm, some of them are escaping me now, but it's, it's really remarkable when you see the type typology laid bare. Well, Christ carries his own cross, right? And then uh, uh, Isaac carries, yeah. carries the wood. his wood too, yeah. yeah. And, um, well, another one is the willingness because, uh, so Isaac is 25, which makes Abraham, what, 124, 125 years old. Mm. Um, I, and Isaac's not like an idiot. You know, he, he doesn't have like a mental handicap. So he knows that they're going up on the mountain for a sacrifice. He's carrying the wood. There is no animal. And then he allows himself, the Agadah, to be bound. Yeah. Like he didn't stop uh, his father when he totally could have, which is, you know, Lord, if it, if it be possible, let this cup pass, pass from me, but not my will be done, but yours. Mm. It's, it's basically exactly what Isaac did. He didn't say it, but he did it. Yeah. yeah. And that's why it's so crazy that this is the story that often puts people off Christianity, like the Marcionite heresy, or it's so cruel. Because for all the reasons that we we're just talking about, Tim especially, this perhaps more than most other Old Testament stories really gets to the heart of what Christianity is about. And it helped me to understand what religion really means, because what you have to see from it is that uh, it's not just about conforming our minds to the truth and understanding something. It's also about squaring our wills to it. Like, what are you going to do? It's not a matter of just reading some books and understanding some abstractions. It's how are you going to actually fulfill your duty like your your most important duty as a rational animal, the main purpose of your life, which is to obey God, obey and honor God. So faith is about the submission of our minds and all that we you know, might have as our personal ideas and our pride about the way things should go for us and how our lives should be. Submitting that to God's authority because he's truth himself. I think it's also uh, the best blueprint, maybe the only blueprint for what, how a man can become great. So if you, and I mean great in, in actually the worldly sense, that in order for a man to become great, uh, he has to not chase the end result and he, then he's going to be tried as it's leading up to it. And then if he passes all of these tests, namely the tests of, are you willing to not have what you could, then you'll get it. And cause like, there's no person who had a dynasty greater than Abraham. And there's no person who had a greater impact, both like historically, but also um, materially. He, he was the efficient cause of like everything of meaning in that area of the world. Um, and then of course in salvation history itself. Um, and it's fascinating to hear like when Christ is talking to the Pharisees, they're still referencing like, are you a descendant of Abraham? You know, what tribe are you from? Like this is, it's so real. It's so dynastic that, what culture is was defined by what Abraham did. And I feel like if a guy has ambition, which is, you know, we talked about on another episode, I think, I think it was you, Tim, who said like, there's almost no instance in which ambition isn't like kind of disordered. Um, so it's like, all right, young man, you want to be great. 
You want the Bugatti, you want the dynasty, you want the kids, you want the land, you want the woman, you want all these things. Um, if you claim to have any kind of love of God, you should pay very, very close attention to what was required of Abraham in order to get the greatest of all of those things. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not making your coffee at home so you can like invest that money in a low cost index fund or something. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's not, it's not doing, um, sales or whatever in order to get the dynasty, to get the greatness. Um, mm. and if you get it and that's, and that's the, the, um, the irony, it's sort of like the temptation that Christ got from Satan. If you kneel before me, I will give you the kingdoms of the world. Mm -hmm. I'll just graft onto your purview, um, everything all of the power if you just submit to me. And I feel like that's what guys do when they have this grind set and they try to hustle with like monetarily because once they get it, it's never enough. Obviously it's the hedonic treadmill. It'll never be enough. I mean, look at Andrew Tate, like how many supercars does he keep buying? And he's like, I did it because I wanted to, I did it because it was the most expensive car. They only made 20 of them and I wanted one. It's like, all right, so that treadmill doesn't end, first of all. And second of all, um, I have this conception. I'm, I have no idea if this is how it's going to work at your particular judgment, but this was sort of imagery that came to me while I've been discussing suffering with Tim over the last few months. And that is that at the moment of your death, um, you're going to be confronted with the judge and there will be an account, like you will be made aware of the things that you love, that you love most dear. And those things can be vice. Obviously it can just be sin, but it can also be literally anything else. And in the case of Abraham, like it was his son. And you're going to be given, like, this is totally apocryphal. I have no idea if this is how it works, but I feel like you're going to be given an ultimatum. You can have me, the person of Christ, or you can have this box of things that you have habituated attachment to for your entire life. Which do you want? And so the irony of the guy who's, uh, you know, has this work, quote unquote, work ethic and achieves all of these things, he is habituating um, the wrong answer to that test question at the moment of his death. Whereas Abraham was habituating through faith, through submission to, to God, even being willing to let go of his son so that at the moment of his death, there was nothing standing between him and saying yes to Christ and entering heaven. And as a result, while on earth, he also got every single thing that a man could possibly want. Yeah. And was able to handle it safely. Yeah, Otherwise, it, it would have ruined him. Yeah. And it didn't damn him. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned the idea of dynasty there and legacy. This is the other thing about Abraham that I don't hear talked about enough because it really gives you a good insight into patriarchy. The way he shows virtue in choosing a wife for Isaac. So this is in Genesis 24. So they live among the, the Canaanites, right? So immoral, heathen. So many of the Canaanite women, though, uh, are beautiful and, and rich, but mm -hmm. Abraham does not want his son Isaac to marry one of them. Why? Because although an alliance with the daughter of a Canaan would be politically useful for Abraham, right? There's all kinds of worldly reasons why he might go for that. He knows that they might lead Isaac astray spiritually. So it's not a good option. As a father, he's thinking of his son's spiritual welfare first and foremost. And when it comes to giving counsel to your kids, daughters or sons, remembering the purpose of marriage spiritually is very important. Think about how many guys have probably been told by boomer dads that you just marry the hottest girl that you can find, irrespective of virtue. That's the way a lot of people go around courtship and trying to find a spouse 
And Abraham's point here is that that's misguided. He cares more about his son's spiritual welfare than any kind of temporal gain that marriage as a business contract might result in. And you can see that as well with the idea that, oh, if, as long as I've left my kids enough money, um, I'm a good parent. Mm hmm. Not the case. The, the best legacy you can leave them is ultimately the, the gift of a Catholic faith. That's the uh, real kind of legacy that parents should focus on leaving. So Abraham having as his highest priority in selecting a spouse for his son, virtue and their spiritual future together, that's a role that I don't think many parents have been responsible enough in over recent generations. They've just been dropping that ball. Tim, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's almost as if it's a generational curse or something. Yeah. Because, um, you know, if you, you confront even any of the recent generations, elders over the declining number of church going, widespread across the culture they always just say oh that's literally this is what i've the answer i've gotten every time parents of students i've taught um people you know relatives that they say well that's the you know it's just normal it's normal to fall away and then to, they always come back i was like one it's not normal to fall away the numbers don't bear that out in in previous generations if you're catechized well and everyone in the church is living out at least a non-hypocritical version of the faith that people don't fall away. And two, most people don't come back once they fall away, once they apostatize. They leave the faith and they don't ever come back. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just sort of the, the proof positive of what, you're, what you've just said. And there's a rationalization that is some, some, there's some supplantation of what the main purpose of life is. Mm. The main purpose of life is literally to have the faith. It's not to have money. It's not to have anything material at all. Beautiful women, fast cars, whatever. A lot, you know, plenty of food, big storehouses. It's literally the faith. And for, for the boomer generation, they have to rationalize because they were the generation that it all fell apart during. Now, it's not all their fault. It started falling apart a generation or two beforehand but it was really on their watch and they're the ones that they're the, they're the ones that act as the mouthpieces for what happened and and even now seeing all of the degeneration even, even normies know you know it was the sexual revolution that that really was the the death blow to culture in the west there there is no western country that that shares um, the Christian culture anymore. We all know that it was the sexual revolution right around 1970. And they don't, they don't really, that doesn't give them much pause. They're still, they're still beating the materialist drum. They're like, well, they, they don't ever talk about sex. Um, it's, they don't ever rail against, you know, how fornication is widespread and all that. But if you're talking to a conservative booner, but they're still on the drum about wealth. And it's like, I mean, my favorite, one of my favorite characters in all literature is Bob Cratchit. Uh, you know, like, this is a good man. This is a man to strive to be like, and he's a poor man, you know, a poor man with a sick son. I just, that guy's, that guy's going to be okay, you know, in old age and on his deathbed. And so are his kids, um, his good kids. And so is his wife. And so, you know, I, I guess they just have to, they have to have some rationale for having a, a perverse worldview. You, you have to substitute at some point, in, unless you just have a conversion. Yeah. Great answer. Uh, really fleshed out the idea of the failure of patriarchy being connected to the failure of the spiritual legacy. And when you were talking there about the main purpose of life being to have the Catholic faith, I was just thinking about how one way in which we can be more grateful is just to thank God for the faith, like, like especially the revelation of the mysteries like the Trinity, for example, that just in our natural reason alone, uh, we've got no right to that either. Like the, the gift of the insights into God and his nature that the faith contains, 
That's something that we can all be grateful for every day. And the point that Abraham makes with choosing a spouse for Isaac is showing that he understood that if a woman is the heart of the home and you get that wrong, you get the wrong wife, then the home has heart disease. Like he knew it mattered that much. Mm -hmm. You must have the heart of the home being healthy for the faith to be able to be like pumped around it properly as the nurturer in the household. The wife has a very important part to play. Nick? Well, he also cared that his son <laughs> would have um, a good wife. Like not, not just... Like he cared specifically that his son would be happy because the wife was a good woman um, and like would, would compliment him because she was the heart of the home. Like it mattered on a relational level with his kid, um, not just sort of like an abstract, like marry a good woman sort of mm. thing. Um, in uh the sales um, princess, the sales book introduction to a devout life. He, there was a quote that I was looking for and I found this paragraph that I want to read before I say the quote on this thing before giving birth to St. Augustine, St. Monica offered him repeatedly to God's glory. So before he was born, as he tells himself, as he, as he himself tells us, and it is a good lesson for Christian woman, how to offer the fruit of their womb to God who accepts the free oblations of loving hearts and promotes the desires of such faithful mothers. Skipping ahead a little bit. St. Bernard's mother worthy of such a son was wont to take her newborn babes in her arms and offer them to Jesus Christ. Thenceforth loving them with a reverential love as a sacred deposit from God. And so entirely was her offering accepted that all seven of her children became saints. And when children begin to use their reason, fathers and mothers should take great pains to fill their hearts with fear of God. This the good Queen Blanche did most earnestly by St. Louis, her son, witness her oft-repeated words, My son, I would sooner see you die than guilty of a mortal sin. Words which sank so deeply into the saintly monarch's heart that he himself said, There was no day on which he, they did not recur to his mind and strengthen him in treading God's ways. the difference between that and what we're told good parenthood parenting is i i provide not a single syllable in there had to do with if they got braces what catholic school they went to how many family vacations they went on what presents they got at christmas if they got an allowance, if they had an iPhone, if they got to see their friends, nothing. It was strictly, like Tim said, the gift of the Catholic faith. Or maybe you said that, Will, I'm sorry. Whichever you I think, said. I think we both did. Okay. And then, the but the, the thing that was so touching to me is this idea that God gave you a child and the mother saw it as a deposit this is St. Monica, I think it was. Saw so it as a deposit. No, 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 it wasn't St. Monica. Um, St. Bernard's mother. St. Bernard's mother. And she knew, it was like the parable of the talents. She was entrusted with something, and when she gave it back to God, it had to be greater than when he gave it to her. It had to be, uh, like the investment had to have paid off. And just like that care and love of the soul and not of the body like the again it kind of goes back to my other point who gives a damn if you just overcame the curse of adam like that's the bare basics congrats like there's a roof over your head that's good important like yeah, you're a terrible father if you don't do that, but you're not a good father if you do do that. <laughs> you're just starting to be a good father if you do that. And and that that paragraph just it really grips my heart the I would sooner see you die. It's than also against the law sin. to not, you know, like once you once you have kids, 
negligence is a crime in many states, common law states. Yeah, so, it's like congrats, you're not a criminal. <laughs> you, you you had children. Um, you will go to jail if you leave them exposed. It's it's an irony because in our uh, culture, which loves abortion, still exposure of children is not allowed. Or um, if you legally give them up for adoption, everyone's kind of like, okay, wow. Uh, even even in our culture now, people look down on that. So it it's kind of remarkable that everyone has some roof over their head growing up. Children with bad parents, children with mediocre parents, children with good parents. So I, I'm not even sure if it gets a father on the road to being a good dad. It's just <laughs> literally something in the first world everyone does. Mm. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe this could be a challenge to the listener. Like if you, it, I'm not saying not to feel good about it because sometimes material provision is harder than others. And you know, like if you're, if you're Russell Crowe and Cinderella man, there's real virtue to that, to even just keeping your kids in your home and not sending them yeah. away to live with the richer relatives. Totally. Th okay. Then, then the virtue kicks in, but in ordinary times, <laughs> People need to think about it this way. Like everyone out there, aside from like Pap Finn, the most derelict father who is a murderer, keeps a, a roof over the kids' heads. You need to be thinking more ambitious. Well, what are you talking about? It's a it's a two million dollar roof. No, no, that's not ambitious at all. <laughs> more ambitious as in, okay, I have a fancy roof over my kid's head. All it really takes to keep him alive, because the goal of life is to just be comfortable enough to become virtuous and holy. You, you, like Aristotle says, you need some comfort to even be able to focus on schooling and things like that. Focus on your education. Even the monks get to sleep. You need some place to sleep. You, you know, you'll know, you get pneumonia if you're sleeping out in the cold six of the months of the year. But um, yeah, so the guy that su supplies the $2 million roof over his kid's head needs to think of Abraham needs to think of Bob Cratchit needs to think, wow, I'm tremendously unambitious because all I'm doing is the bare, the bare minimum. It's mm -hmm. a fancy bare minimum, yep. but I'm not doing any of this, of the spiritual, um, um, provision mm -hmm. that really me and my kid will end up being judged on. Yep. I want to finish with this from the catechism of Trent really powerful words on the duties of parents. Many there are whose sole concern is to leave their children wealth, riches, and an ample and splendid fortune, who encourage them not to piety and religion or to honorable employment, but to avarice and an increase of wealth, and who provided their children are rich and wealthy, are regardless of their good name and eternal salvation. Can anything more shameful be thought or expressed? Of such parents, it is true to say that instead of bequeathing wealth to their children, they leave them rather their own wickedness and crimes for an inheritance. And instead of conducting them to heaven, lead them to the eternal torments of hell. So, dynasty, legacy, patriarchy, we finished on some really important stuff there. And that is what we mean by echoes in eternity, right? Mm -hmm. That's where patriarchy extends beyond your own immediate family to the generations after you and has got eternal consequences. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't and, mean fight really well in the Colosseum, <laughs> contrary yeah. to what Maximus says. <laughs> yeah. And just parting, parting thoughts here. When, when the, the mind of the man, the father is reoriented, if it needs to be from material provision to, the 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 tending to the garden of the soul and the heart and the mind of the child what you realize is that first of all that's way harder it might take less time 
but I think it takes more courage, more application of self. And it also, the only way you get to do that is with relationship. You can't phone that in through any other means than getting to be a friend with your child. Right. And I think, I think that's the, the thing that most, most men, most fathers are afraid of is having a relationship with their kid for whatever reason. That's, but that is, once you realize that it's not about money, the only way you actually get to achieve the status of good father is by having a, a meaningful relationship with your kid. Mm. Good discussion, guys. Covered everything I wanted to. And hopefully this will send some people back to the Old Testament to have a look at this story with some fresh eyes. Good to speak with you both. God bless. And looking forward to talking again next week with Mike back as well. And we're going to review Mike's recent appearance on Pints with Aquinas, right? Yeah. Be great. Yeah, great. Great chatting, guys. God bless you both. Good chat. You too. Take care. Have a great week.